Snyder & Associates webinar series, a civil engineering, planning, and design firm focused on thinking beyond engineering to improve quality of life within the communities we serve. This episode's hosts are Tim West and Clay Schneckloth. I think we're going to start off with our breakdown of some of the track surfacing and track construction components associated with those specialty surfaces. Synthetic tracks are something that sometimes fall back into the background. It's really difficult to keep a close eye on the track because it's something that's always there. It's usually been constructed a couple of years ago at your school or in your community. So a lot of times people aren't keeping as close of an eye on that facility as they should be. Most of those consist of a cross-section that looks like the one that we show on the screen here. So whether you're building a new track or you have an existing one that's been built within, let's say, the last 15 to 20 years, it probably looks something like this. It'll consist of a, about a half inch or 13 millimeter track surfacing on a four inch asphalt base. And that all sits on top of a granular base that could be sand, it could be a crushed rock. We want that to freely drain to an interior perforated drain tile that would go around the interior circle of the track. About 90, 95% of the tracks out there have this type of cross section. It's a tried and true method for construction on tracks. Uh, the important part is really making sure the soils and the drainage are done to the appropriate method. The most common track surfacing system is the base mat system, which consists of some sort of a rubber granule and a polyurethane full pour, which gives a consistent depth of that 13 millimeters. SBR rubber is a type of synthetic rubber, but it's usually generated from recycled tires and turned into this crumb rubber for that product. Due to the recycled nature of that, SBR base mat is only available in black, but it's the least costly option. It has good resiliency, polyurethane, and the rubber granules bond well together. There is some permeability associated with these systems, so you have to make sure that the asphalt base is built correctly with no ponding so that you're not experiencing any delamination. But we'll get to that in a little bit later in the webinar. The next step up would be a base mat system, but it would be out of an EPDM rubber. The difference on that is that EPDM is a synthetic rubber, but it's more of a virgin or new, new rubber. So you can colorize that and get almost any color that you'd like on that. Same thickness is established that 13 millimeters, but it gives you a large range of aesthetics that you can include into your project. The new aspect of the material is more expensive than recycled material. And then the colorization also costs more. So all in all, the, the product costs a little bit more than the base mat system to add the color into it. We're also starting to see some combination systems in there. The base mat with structural spray shown on the right, you can get by with a little less SBR rubber or the base mat system at 10 millimeters and move in with a structural spray right away instead of putting it on after the track's been established for a while. The advantage of this is that structural spray can hold up to traffic a little better, is more resistant to track spikes, and you can add color to it because of it being an, an EPDM product through the rubber spray. The disadvantage, of course, is that it costs more and there is some limit to the number of structural sprays that you can put on track. So you kind of get the best of both worlds here, but you do limit yourself to the number of structural sprays in the future. The special design considerations that we take into account mostly revolve around making sure the base is solid. So soil borings are an important aspect to determine the soil characteristics. We're specifically looking for expansive soils and any types of high water table or wet soils where it might indicate we have a, a water problem that would potentially perch underneath our track pavements. We're also looking to make sure that we're draining surface flow away from the track. So if there's any types of hills or slopes that are coming down towards a lower track, we would want to install sub drains to pull that water away from the track and leave that pavement high and dry so that there's a low chance of water infiltrating and collecting in there and then freezing and thawing over the winter months. Beyond establishing sub drains into those conditions, we can also chemically stabilize those sub bases if we have a tight schedule or if we just cannot disc and dry and dry out those subsoils 
by adding fly ash or a similar product incorporating it into the subgrade. We would recommend that we carry some allowance for that anyway, because even if the soils are pretty good, we would want to potentially use it if we have a in ordinary wet spring or the schedule's extra tight where we have to have the track done and open by a certain time frame. I know you're gonna get into discussions here a little bit later on the on the fly ash, but that is a costly item that seems to be a surprise to a lot of people when we bring that up. Definitely. Also on the HMA mix design, Tim's been talking about the top surface portion of it. The HMA, the base that, that holds this top surface thing is important also. There's a few different things that we would make aware of or make sure we talk about here too. The top of that HMA surface, the asphalt, needs to be a smooth surface to be able to put the top coating on top of it. So we've designed and worked with asphalt suppliers too on, on different mixes for this top surfacing of the asphalt. And we usually use a 3 8 inch rock in that mix to be able to create that smooth surface. By doing that smooth surface, there's a possibility of, of some bird bass, even with a rougher surface, there's a possibility of bird bass. So the importance of making sure we get this at a 1% cross slope and as tight as you can without the bird bass is very critical. So as we're moving into the design schedule, we've started the process where we've looked at the design of what the actual track is. Now we're looking into when should we start talking with you and getting this project figured out to move forward into construction. Most of our projects, we need to be starting mid-May and they happen over the summer months. Track was in a spring event. So we try and coordinate with the different school districts on, on timing of construction. Most of this construction happens over the summer months. We back into uh, bidding this project in, uh, in between January and February it would be ideal situation. We'd like to get this out to bid. So which means we would have to back into a topo survey, getting the ground figured out what we have in that area, getting the geotech work taken care of before that. So we're talking about November, December, October, November, December of getting the survey geotech work so we can get into doing design, getting into the bid of January, February. It does take 10, 12 weeks to get design figured out and approval. A lot of times we'll need to go to a city for approval or, or school boards for approval too, which leads into the construction schedule. The HMA really needs to be installed by July 15th. It does have a 20-day gearing time on it before we can start putting the servicing on it. Typically, it takes them about four to five days to getting that surface weather dependent, always weather dependent on that, and getting the surface down on top of the asphalt. Our nighttime temperatures need to be above 45 degrees, and once we get into mid-October, the weather is always up in the air, so we want to try and get all of that taken care of before October if possible. When we start talking about budget considerations, a couple of keys we'd like to bring to your attention. There's a lot of discussion that'll need to occur on how the D areas are treated. That's the infield area between like the plain field and the, the track curvature. There's needs to be some decisions made as to whether you're going to continue to use that in a natural turf format? Do you want to do synthetic turf in the D area or do you want to complete that with track surfacing, which includes asphalt and drains, etc.? We're usually encouraging people to pave those D areas because it allows for some multi-purpose space. You also can put your high jump and long jump facilities in those within the track circle. And it usually is a little bit cheaper than synthetic turf if you're considering that. Budget numbers for a new track system, which means going from tearing out the old track and putting in new rock base, new tiles, new asphalt pavement, et cetera, is about six hundred dollars to $700,000. So we'd encourage you to carry that as a, a rule of thumb budget number as you start to think about new track construction. If your asphalt base is in good shape or relatively new and you're just looking to replace your base mat or track surfacing system, $160,000 to $170,000 will probably do it. That allows for some repair of cracking within the surfacing. And if you just need a structural spray, $90,000 is a, a budget number that we'd recommend that does include a little bit of crack repair as well. 
Long-term maintenance really is important on the track. Sometimes it's deceiving when you aren't out there all the time and the majority of the track is used by either the public or potentially just only by the track team. Yearly inspections are important. You can identify any sort of cracking and repair it right away so those small cracks don't turn into large ones. We'd recommend that you walk that with a qualified contractor that specializes in those track surfacings and track repair methods. We'd recommend you also consider a structural spray in year five to seven. That'll be dependent upon where on the track and usage. That will allow you to gain another five to seven years over the life of that track. If you let it go all the way without a structural spray, we've been seeing base mat wear out roughly in year 12 to 15. At that point, you may have to replace the base mat entirely. If you had a structural spray in year five or seven, you might be able to get by with another structural spray. So when you start to consider numbers like $90,000 for a structural spray, those numbers need to be included in any projection of budgets down the road. It's not just about the installation initially, but having a maintenance budget that you can invest into over time and hit some of these dates. Thank you for listening to Snyder & Associates webinar series, a civil engineering, planning, and design firm focused on thinking beyond engineering to improve quality of life within the communities we serve. Find content related to this episode on snyder-associates.com.